welcome back to the second part of arrangements. Uh, so to quickly refresh and recap, uh, what we did in the first part was uh, essentially, you know, showing the relationship between, you know, points and lines using an, you know, a transformation called dual transform, so that, you know, the problems involving points are not not very different from points uh, problems in involving lines. So lines and points are two faces of the same coin, kind of. You know that that was the objective of the of the first part of the lecture. Now let me take it further. So I'll, now let me get more into arrangement. So rather than looking at you know uh, problems involving points, which we know that we can now map into lines, let's let's explore that structure. Okay. <coughs> so that structure is essentially the the lines, okay. So, so I said here is a set of lines L, L one, L two, L second, and let's let's study what is the structure these lines actually impose on the plane. And uh, we will. I'll stick to lines on planes because you know drawing uh, planes on three dimensions is not possible in the screen, and it, it doesn't convey, you know, uh, the the essence uh, as as easily as I can do using uh, uh, two dimensions. But all these have a very natural analog in the higher dimension. In the higher dimensions, we're talking about, you know, planes or hyperplanes in in some d dimensions. So <coughs> the first thing to note about you know such a structure is okay let me just label them first and i should have so there are only four lines i've drawn okay four lines so i have these four lines of course in general there are many more lines so what is the the uh let us say the partitioning that it involve that it imposes on the plane. Okay, so the 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 when you look at such a structure, okay, and <coughs> you see essentially the lines are like you know it it, it 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 you can define a graph basically on this. You know, so this is let us say A's of L is this. I'm formally now introducing arrangement of lines. Okay, this is the structure that is called the arrangement. And what do we mean by arrangement? The arrangement essentially means that we define the structure that is induced on the plane. Okay. What is the structure induced by L? That is basically the arrangement. Okay. And what comes across very readily is it's a graph basically that is getting defined okay. and the graph is defined by the intersection points can be thought of as vertices okay so these are precisely the vertices okay. and as i said if we assume that the arrangement is a simple arrangement so in a simple arrangement uh, no three lines are concurrent the number of intersections is given by n choose 2 right every pair of line intersects in a point and that is basically going to be our set of vertices okay so so v basically corresponds to this intersection points right now clearly the edges will be basically the part of the line joining 
two consecutive intersection points. So then basically this is an edge, this is an edge, this is an edge. Unfortunately, how about this? So because there is no more intersection points, okay, it does not quite fit into this definition. Okay. So what we will do is we can make some you know assumption, not a, pro, uh, a, a kind of a convention that these uh, infinite rays okay, which are can be, so it is not an edge in the sense that it is not bounded by vertices on both sides. We can imagine that there is a vertex, you know, we can, we can uh, think about, so this, this is a kind of a planar graph. Let, let me first actually point out what is this planar graph. So this is E, okay. L let me just leave this and I will come back to it, you know, what happens to these semi-infinite semi -infinite edges, okay. Uh, so there are some semi-infinite edges, right. So we will deal with the semi infinite edges. So that we'll deal with. Before that, let me mention what the faces are, right? So the faces again, so it's a planar graph, right? So now this is a face. Is this visible? Okay. So that is a face, this is a face, this is a face and now when it comes to some of these faces again, these are not bounded faces, right? Because the same reason that the edges are semi-infinite, these faces are unbounded, okay? But still let us live with that, okay? And let us see how to deal with it, okay? So the faces. bounded plus unbounded defined by a cycle, right? So this is clearly there is a cycle defining this cycle of vertices. This is a cycle. Unfortunately, this is not a closed cycle, right? So this is open, basically these are unbounded, these are unbounded. So one thing we can um, imagine is that suppose I put this graph on a surface of a sphere, okay. Instead of drawing on the plane, suppose I put it in a sphere, then all these semi-infinite edges, we can take it to some one point on the other side and make them join, okay. It still remains planar, right. And once it remains planar, we can apply many properties of the planar graph. That is the reason, okay. So imagine a point at infinity, infinity or let us say embed on a sphere let us say some special point um, capital no no it's not about this capital p um, let's say some capital q okay uh, such that all semi infinite edges converge into q then that implies all faces are also bounded. Okay. So this is the structure basically induced by a set of n lines. Right. And now since it, it, it's a planar graph, okay, as I said, you can apply all the properties of planar graph on this. And the first thing that comes to mind is how many faces and how many edges. We know the number of vertices is equal to n choose 2 in a simple arrangement. Okay. Now how would you count the number of edges on this structure? How many edges are there? Okay. 
So there is one thing that you can easily invoke, I mean, without even blinking, and that is because it's a planar graph, okay, from Euler's formula, the number of faces, number of edges, number of vertices are all sort of linearly related to each other. So once I've got a bound on the number of vertices, okay, that is about n square, right? This is about n square. Let's say n square by 2 or whatever. Then the number of faces, number of edges will also be bounded by this. Okay? That, that is one way of sort of you know, just brushing it aside. On the other hand, you can actually look at it more closely because it's, it's a geometric graph, okay? uh, sorry, I mean defined by some geometric uh, objects. And let's look at one line. Any one line, basically like this, this line. So this line basically will contain how many intersections? n minus 1, right? So there are n minus 1 intersections, and therefore there are how many edges? Well, including the two semi-infinite ones, there will be n edges, right? So each line basically contains n edges, and therefore the n lines will contain about n square edges. So you got a bound there very easily. Right? Similarly, you can argue about the number of faces. One is that you can plug in the Euler's formula, okay? So, so I think you can you can plug in. So one, I can do that. I have the number of edges, I have the number of vertices, and I use this. Uh, so if I'm not wrong, it is uh, v minus e plus f equal to 2, right? That's your Euler's formula, right? So let me just quickly check, minus 1 plus 1, yeah, right. So I can just plug it into this formula and get the number of faces out of it. On the other hand, I can also do some kind of geometric arguments. So if you look at any intersection point, okay, every intersection point basically is defines a unique face in the sense that it will be the lowest point of any closed face. Okay. So for instance, if I look at this one, this one is the lowest vertex of some face. This one will be lowest vertex of some face, and this face better be bounded. So this property only holds for bounded faces, right? So if there are n choose two intersection points, there are definitely n choose two faces, plus the unbounded faces, okay? And the unbounded faces also have a very nice structure. If you, I've drawn this diagram, if I could actually zoom out, then you would have, what would you have seen from very far? Suppose you, I zoom out on this, what happens? Okay, let me just maybe give you, draw a diagram. So if I zoom out, I claim that if I went very far, okay, it will basically look like something like a bunch of lines, okay? Is this visible or this line, okay? So the entire interesting part of the arrangement, the bounded faces, you know, will be limited within some maximum x coordinate, maximum y coordinate of the intersection points, right? So it's all sort of just confined to a small region, okay? And there are these basically outgoing rays, right? So there are basically these 2n rays going out, right? So from far, any arrangement would look like this, right? All the intersection points are confined within some region, okay? And they are basically lines going out, and, and the good thing is that these lines are, can also be ordered, you know, in some counterclockwise or clockwise manner. So this is one way to think about arrangements, that when you very go very far, all the intersection points are confined to some region, you can bound it by the maximum y coordinate, x coordinate of the intersection points, and the rays are kind of fanning out, and they can be ordered, right? So then what happens if you go to the no, so as I argued that every intersection point 
is the uh, is, a, is uniquely sort of associated with the face because it's a uh, lowest point of face. Okay, so there are n choose two such faces plus. There are these faces which are unbounded faces. And how many faces are there? Unbounded faces? So basically, you, you go from, so all these are faces, right? Basically, this is a face, this is a face, this is a face, and so on and so forth. So about another, there are n lines, so there are two, two n rays, okay? Is 2n. So, total number of faces, so n choose 2 plus 2n. So, this is a geometric way of arguing rather than plugging it into the Euler's formula. Right. Any doubts? Okay. So, we have got a bound on the number of faces, number of vertices, number of edges, you know, and they are all linearly related because it is a planar map finally. What else? So, okay. So the other thing to notice about this diagram is, oh, by the way, let me also point out very quickly that in d dimensions, total number of vertices is how much? So in two dimensions, two lines intersection a point. Okay, in three dimensions, three planes will intersect in a point, right? And let's again assume the simplicity of the arrangement. That is, no four planes intersect in a point. So I am saying the three dimensions total number of vertices, assuming no d plus one planes are concurrent. It just keeps our calculations easier, and it's also the worst case. Actually, if they are concurrent planes, there are fewer vertices. You can argue that. Right? So, if so, that will be what then? And then choose d, right? Then roughly about into the power d. So, in d equal to two, it's about n square. Actually, n square over two. I'm I'm forgetting the constants basically. I'm I'm doing away the constants. So, it's into the d. So, the total size of the arrangement A of let us say L is equal to number of faces plus number of edges plus number of vertices. If you think about it like a graph, okay, and this is basically O of n square the two dimensions that is easily established. Now, in higher dimension that is slightly harder because in higher dimension you have to deal with many kinds of faces and facets actually. So, in d dimensions you have various things right. So, you have let us say um, facets of dimension let us say i and i is basically between d minus 1 to 0. So, zero dimension is a point, a point is a d dimensional uh, zero dimensional geometric entity okay? and d minus 1 dimensional is the actual plane. Right? In two dimensions the line is a one dimensional structure that is sitting in the two dimensions and there is a point right? and there are faces. So, actually I should plus of course, the faces themselves I should write sorry. the faces themselves are d dimensions because d dimensional faces. These faces are actually you know that encloses some volume right. So, they are facets of lower dimension and there are these faces. Now, to get a bound on all this, the total size of the number of, I need to get a bound on every facet of dimension i. Okay. What is easily established is 
the number of vertices, the zero dimensional faces, facets that are n to the power d. But now I have to also work on the other kinds of facets. And that takes a while, so I will not, I will skip this part here, okay. It's, 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 it's actually not that hard, but on the other hand, some, something laborious, right. Actually, from this assumption about simplicity, okay, you can figure out that a i dimensional facet is defined by exactly d minus i hyperplanes. So when it comes to two dimensions, two lines define a point. Okay, so it's an intersection basically. As you intersect more and more hyperplanes, the dimension is going to reduce by one. Right? That is where it comes. So an i-dimensional facet is defined by exactly d minus one i uh, hyperplanes. And so therefore, now you can actually write down this series of, you know, d choose d minus i summation. Right? So you'll have to basically then do this. So total number of i-dimensional facets <coughs> is d choose d minus i, which implies that summation over all i-dimensional facets is summation of d choose, oh, ju just a moment, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They are n, right? So among n, I choose d minus y. Okay, it will be total facets. So if you <coughs> work this out, again you will actually see that it will turn out to be about n to the power d roughly. But with a caveat that higher dimension is extremely difficult to visualize, okay. And what we are going to suppress in this is that when I say it's going to be order of n to the power d, I'm not looking at the constants and the constants depend on d, right. So with that caveat, you know, this is about order n to the power d. So remember, whenever we are working in very high dimensions, okay, actually things grow very quickly with dimensions. Okay, it's called the curse of dimensionality. Okay, again, you know, we, we won't be able to discuss it in this lecture, but you'll all you know, often come across situations where you'll see that you know number of facets basically are going to grow exponentially in dimensions. Okay, it is to some extent captured here, but not the full extent of it, and that is why you know we always talk about. Uh, you know, not very high dimensions, it's, we call it fixed, we use this term called fixed dimensions, okay. When we say fixed dimensions, so there's this, in geometric algorithms we often use this notion of fixed dimension. So fixed dimension essentially means that D is not scaling, okay. So when I write a formula, let us say that something like n to the power d, it may have a hidden constant to the extent of maybe even d factorial, which is d to the power d. But if you consider d to be fixed, that is it's like a constant, it may be 10, it may be 15, it may be 20, then we actually using the big O notation or let us say abusing the big O notation, we can completely do away with the d factorial. Because you know that, you know, if it is constant, it is some number, very large number times n, okay, can be written as big O of n. But only if we consider d to be non-scalable, that it is fixed once and for all. But then if you look at the growth with respect to d, you cannot treat it like that. Then you have to look at d factorial as d to the power d, okay. So often in many geometric algorithms, we say it is a fixed dimension, okay. 
and it's often confusing to people who have who don't have not read the literature what does it really mean it really basically means is that it's a relatively small dimension where you can ignore the leading constants that's what it means right so even in the case of arrangements in higher dimensions n to the power d actually has a leading constant which is quite large but we suppress it just say that it is big o of n to the power d so this is basically about what is this structure this arrangement structure that we have whether it's in two dimension or d dimensions you know this is the size of the structure right this is basically all sorts of facets and faces why is, why is size important because finally we may want to store it in a data structure right eventually what are we doing we have a set of lines okay and if you want to create a data structure like what we started in the morning that tell me you know which if given a query point which line lies above it then i created those parallel slabs right now each parallel slab basically had lines intersecting how many slabs were there there were n square slabs right each slab had n lines which means that the space of the data structure was n cube okay let me just quickly show you this we never discussed it then this structure right so each slab has size n because there are n lines intersecting and you want to create a data structure ordered data structure size n there are n square slabs because these slabs are being defined by the intersection points this is only in two dimension in two dimensions we have it is already n cube in d dimensions it's going to really grow like it, in fact it can you even guess how fast it grows it's not n to the power d this structure if we generalize to higher dimensions grows as n to the power 2 to the power d it is a horrendous thing so we'll never actually do it it just that it gives you a very simple search data structure here i can do with two binary searches in d dimensions i can do with d binary searches but the data structure itself will be huge okay n to the power 2 to the power d okay so let me just write it down perhaps in two dimension search data structure has size n square well actually maybe i should write n choose 2 n choose 2 times n that is about n cube in d dimension so this structure can be extended to d dimensions okay so when you have these planes okay and you are going to look at the pairwise intersection of planes that will be a line and then the lines can be projected into the um, x z axis and then you can define this vertical um, cylindrical kind of structures and then within the cylindrical structure there will be no intersections okay so this taking pairwise planes creates n choose two lines then taking the pairwise lines it creates n choose 2 choose 2 that is n to the power 4 so that's how it keeps growing basically so if this structure were to be generalized to higher dimension it grows at a horrendous rate right so in d dimension this scheme requires n to the power 2 to the power d so query is very fast it's d times log n but space is horrendous right so again the upshot is that you know many things work well in lower dimensions that don't scale up very well in geometry and that is one of the basic problems and why are we interested in higher dimensional geometry well not because i am so trying to solve the what i look at the real life problem re real life geometric problems you know this room is a three dimensional structure so oh it's a minus 1 maybe so i am missing out something uh, perhaps so is d equal to 2 uh, yeah so it is a minus 1 i sorry thanks for reminding me so it was a minus 1 does it work now 2 uh, 4 uh, so it is 2 to the power d minus 1 it is not 2 to the power d minus 1 it's 2 to the power d minus 1 the whole thing so then if you have d equal to 2 it is 2 to the power 2 4 minus 1 3 into the power 3 right? <coughs> but 
Well, at, at that rate, even minus one doesn't make any difference. But yeah, that is true. So, uh, so even so, things in real life that we try to capture using geometry, those are all like three-dimensional structures. Okay, we grow in dimensions, or there is a requirement in dimension when we try to uh, model, you know, basically all kinds of other problems using geometric methods. For in instance, database problems. You know, database problems can be always recast as a geometric problem. And those problems become very high dimensional depending on basically number of attributes in the data structure. So if I have 10 attributes, we need to go to 10 dimensions. If we have 100 attributes, we need to go to 100 dimensions. Okay? So things like all kinds of database problems, clustering problems, these are not, we don't see the clusters in three dimensions in real life. You know, these are clusters coming out of other kinds of input, which have many, many parameters. So when you actually map it to the geometry, it is mapped to very high dimensions. And then these kind of techniques becomes pretty much useless because they scale up very rapidly with dimension. So whatever we do in you know, geometric algorithms, there is this caveat that low dimensions can be very misleading. Okay? High dimensions you know, grow so rapidly that you will not be able to use these algorithms in real life. So the real geometric problems are okay because we are confined by you know, our ability to only see, three, see or feel three dimensions. You know, whether God has made 100 dimensions, we don't know. We can't feel them. Right? But other problems that are recast as a geometric problem, you may have issues. Okay. Fine. So let me go back to the arrangement part. So higher dimensional arrangements are pretty much useless because it grows as n to the power d. Two dimensions is still fine. Okay. Now what else are we interested in an arrangement? Okay. Let's look at that. So Okay, maybe I should redraw the diagram here, just change. So let me again redraw some diagrams. I think you have drawn five lines, one, two, three. So let me number them. L1, L2, L3. L4. Maybe I can draw one more. Maybe I should have drawn, I should have used five colors. Um, let me see. Okay. Let it be like this. Okay. Uh, now, at any so I have this set of lines. Let me draw a vertical line at some point. So some fixed value of x, I draw this vertical line. Right. So if I don't have any vertical line in the arrangement, okay, I have no issues. So as I said that you know, let's assume that there is no vertical line in the given set of lines. So when I draw a vertical line, there is nothing that it coincides with. So it always cuts, it intersects. Right? So if you have n lines, so if you have five lines, there will be basically five intersection points. Right? Oh, I have more than, I have, I'm missing one line somewhere. I had not labeled it. No, I have one, two, three, five. Okay. 
So I have these five intersection points. Now this vertical line defines what is called basically the levels of arrangement. What do I mean by the levels? Okay. So if I keep moving this line okay, horizontally, okay, the intersection points will change, but at any fixed x axis, there will be five intersections, unless I am at the intersection point. Okay. Now, the part of this plane, you know, this is this is the plane, okay. So the part of the plane that lies below k minus 1 lines that is called the kth level. Okay. So the subset of R square, the plane that is below k lines is called kth level of so this is the arrangement right so of this arrangement i have defining what is called the kth level okay let's call it denote by a k of l so according to this definition, we can even have a zero level, right? So this part basically is a zero level. Because it is below the first line. Okay? And I can draw the boundary of the zero level easily by by this, right? So maybe I should do this. So this is the boundary of the zero level, right? And then as I cross this boundary of the zero level then I get the first level, level 1. right? And how is the first level going to be defined? Again, it is going to be between some boundaries. Let me now try to use another color. So, so it comes here. Okay? So this is 0 level, this is first level. And the first level should always stay above the 0 level. So at this intersection point, I must diverge, okay. then I come here, and then I come here, and I come here, and I stay. Okay. So the entire portion below this uh, dark yellow line okay, is level 1. Then I can have second level, right? True. So then the second level will start from here. So how do I start? I basically go to the extreme left where basically there are no more further intersection points and I start counting basically the lines, right? So I start from here. I cannot go above because if I go above then I will be in level 3. So I should follow at every intersection point basically we have a broke break right then again i go here and then i oh sorry sorry i made a mistake <laughs> should have stopped me <coughs> so i go here because that's the yellow line I, I, it's like the metro lines right So this is level 2, right? And then I will have 
maybe with the green. You get the idea now, right? I go here, I go here, I go here, go here, go here. So I'm using different colors for different levels. And then finally, I have a level 4. Level 4 will start from here and kind of finishes here. So you get the idea? All right. So and the edges basically. Um, Actually, sorry, I, I, should, I should need to revise this. Sorry, the, the edges. So, edges basically means that uh, it should be on one of the lines. So, the edges of R square that is below k lines is called the kth level. So, I have drawn the 0 8 level, 1 level, 2 level, and the subset of R square below the kth level is known as less than or equal to k level. So let me see if uh, level sorry, less than or equal to k level denoted by A less than or equal to k. Okay. Right. So the portion that I showed in yellow actually is the less than or equal to zero level. Okay. But whatever I draw on the edges, are those, are those are exactly the kth level. So the edges define the kth level. Less than or equal to k is below that level. Right. So this uh, actually takes care of all edges and all vertices. Right. So the arrangement takes care of the, the, the levels basically union of all levels union of all levels define Now, what are the properties of these levels? What, why are we even defining or interested in the levels? That's the question. So, one thing that you may notice is the levels observation. The levels are monotonic chains. Monoto, monotonic. So, monotone with respect to x. Right. So, when you go, you follow a level from left to right, it will never bend backwards, it will always move forward. Because it bent backward, obviously it is not a level, because if it bent backward, one of them is higher than the other. So, it cannot be. So, if you draw a vertical line through any of the levels, okay, it will intersect exactly at one point. You take any level and draw a vertical line, it will intersect exactly at one point. Right. However, you can see that the level 0 and the top level 4 has a special structure. Can you tell me what? Level 0, the bottom most level and the top most level, they have a special structure. What is the structure? Every, all the levels are unbounded. No, different by lines, right? They are all extend to infinity. So they, they are all unbounded in the sense. Oh, well, I, I see. Okay, what do you mean? So yeah, it's unbounded. That's one. Okay, fine. I get what you see. What else? What is the shape of those? Yeah, exactly. So the topmost and the bottommost levels are convex. Okay. 
Well, strictly speaking, one is concave, one is convex, but let's use the term convex. Okay. So this is observation one, and observation two is the topmost bottom most So not only they are monotonous, monotonic, but they are also convex. So these are all some of the properties, the main properties that we get out of a level. No, not necessarily, not at all. In fact, you can see that you know they will be bent. Look at the red chain; it is bending in the other direction. So it can bend in both direction. Okay, so good point. Not necessarily true yeah, that's a good point. So topmost and bottommost have this nice property. Intermediate we don't have any property. They are monotonic, but not necessarily convex. Okay, another thing that people are interested in, so this monotonic chains, by the way, <coughs> let me give you a quick example of this. So we had done this. Let us go back to the this transformation. Okay. And you recall that I was this diagram is basically the lifting transform. We took those points, projected onto this paraboloid, okay, and you drew these tangential planes at those points. Okay. And I'm sure you have discussed in your Warner diagram lecture that this is basically nothing but you look at a basically set of lines or set of planes, and this is the topmost level. So the topmost level basically corresponds to the nearest neighbor Warner diagram. Because if I project it to the plane, it exactly gives me the Warner diagram. Right? So that topmost level, you construct the intersection of the topmost level, and you just project it, it is the Warner diagram. Because that corresponds to the nearest neighbor. You go to the next, because of this relation that the distance between two points is the square, so this is related, right? The distance between the two points and the vertical distance they are related by a square. So the closest uh, neighbor will be the closest when we do a, when we sh shoot down a ray from this point, right? Which, whichever is the closest. Now there are other, other planes below this, right? So there could be other planes. For instance, you know, I could draw another plane, okay? So that, the point corresponding to this plane, okay, is not as close as the point above this. But then again, from the same relation, you can say the next one must be the next closest. So Warner diagram is not only about nearest points, but also about the second nearest point, the third nearest point, and the fourth nearest point, and so on and so forth, all the way to the furthest neighbor Warner diagram. So when I basically do a ray shooting from this point, this is the projection. Sorry. So this is B projected on this. This is this is a like a you know, a one-dimensional Warner diagram, but it holds for two dimensions, three dimensions, whatever. So from there, the closest point, the closest plane corresponds to the closest nearest neighbor. The second one, the second neighbor, and so on and so forth. And therefore, the second one, you can actually construct this level two of the arrangement. What I said was a level two of the arrangement. So the topmost level gives you the nearest neighbor Warner diagram. The next level, again, if you project it, will give you the second nearest neighbor, the third nearest neighbor, all the way to the most, the bottom most layer will give you the furthest uh, neighbor Warner diagram. And the furthest and the nearest are easiest to co con uh, construct because they are convex. 
So if I know how to intersect planes, that is, construct the intersection of planes, then I can construct the nearest Voronoi diagram and the furthest Voronoi diagram. The other ones are harder to construct. But they are all related by these arrangements. So once I have the arrangements of the projected lifted, lifted transform, okay, so let me point this out. The arrangement is of let us say the duals of the points. Okay, this is the dual plane of P. Okay, corresponds to the k nearest neighbor Voronoi so if p is a set of points points so i should not say dual okay let me change that let me call it d star okay the set of d star of p is the lifted transformation. So it's not the dual, it's not the point to line, it is basically lifted transformation where the planes are actually tangential to the paraboloid. So I am saying basically, let me draw this diagram again. So I am given these points and I have the unit paraboloid. So this is your P, these are the lifted transform, the points projected to the paraboloid. And then what do I do? I actually draw the tangents, right? So this is a tangent, this is a tangent, this is a tangent, so there can be all kinds of tangents, right? So in, in two to three dimensions, these are planes, right? So I'm talking about these planes, the planes Then this arrangement basically, so the kth level of P corresponds to Voronoi K of P. So again, you have got something because of the dual transformation, the lifting transformation. The lifting transformation, dual transformation are very related actually. Right. So you have got, you, you don't have to design Voronoi diagram algorithm separately. You can just construct the intersection of the half places, half planes, half, uh, half spaces and get the Voronoi diagram out of it. So it's again a two for one D. Now it's a three for one D actually, right? So because of the dual transform, you can get these things, okay? All right, now I'll just take another five minutes, okay, sorry. Uh, so my last topic for arrangement is the notion of what I call the, so I have defined levels, now let me define this thing called zone. So right. So I again have some lines right. so again a set of given a set of lines so 
I have let us say a line that is not part of that. Okay. So, maybe I draw a line like this. It is not geometrically straight. <laughs> so, this is the line that I have drawn some line L okay. and given lines L 1, L 2, L n. Now, this line that I have just now drawn is going to intersect this arrangement. right? How many point of intersections are there? N points, right? N lines, N points. Okay, so clearly these are the intersection points. Right? So it intersects all the lines. Now, what I want to do. I want to look at basically all this, these are also sometimes called cells, right. The faces can are also sometimes called cells or let us say faces, okay. So, look at all the faces of the arrangement that it intersects, okay. So, the face basically is, is this face, this face, this face, this face, this face, whatever it goes through, this face and so on and so forth, okay. But this is not a phase that it goes through, right? This is not a phase that it intersects. So only look at those phases that it intersects. Now, since it intersects n lines, okay, it intersects n phases, right? Now, what I'm interested in is so consider all phases of that L intersects. This is called the zone okay. so that is a zone. You can think about it like that this red line actually is illuminated. Okay and all the lines are basically opaque. Now, if I illuminate this, look at the part of the arrangement that lights up. The light cannot pass through the lines. So, that basically is the zone of the arrangement. Now, the zone of the arrangement is what we are interested in are two things. One is that what questions? what is the size of the zone in the worst case. So, size basically means the summation okay, over all edges in the zone. That is basically what it is. So, I can say that E intersects zone is not empty. Right? So, I look at all the edges. So, if you look at the faces that the line passes through. So, for instance, it has this is an edge, okay. this is another edge, this is another edge this is another edge. So, the first face itself has four edges. right? The next face again has this, this, this and this. So, let me count an edge could be visible from either side. So, let me count is that it has two. Okay? So, it is basically what I am looking for is the total number of edges summed over all the entire zone, summed over all faces that the line goes through. So, what is the size of that? Now, you can see that one face can be very large, right? 
I can have a situation where I mean I could have a situation where a single face in the zone can be size n. Do you believe this? So, basically it is like you know I, I look at the intersection of all the lines and that intersection of all the lines can have size n because I can make all the a situation like this right. right. So, this is an arrangement and if the line passes through this one this face basically has all the possible edges. So, a single face can be very bad it can have size n. Now, if I use that bound then the size of the zone would be n times n because no face can be more than n and there are n faces. So, that will be give you n square, okay. but let me give you a surprise the size of the zone turns out to be order n it is linear. Okay. <coughs> so, that proof I would not be able to give now maybe I will do it in the the, the in the uh, in the afternoon tutorial session okay i'll give you a proof of that so this is where i will end theorem zone l of arrangement of this l lines is order n so this is the surprising result and why is the zone theorem useful? Use of zone theorem. There are many applications, but one is simply in we have never discussed this how to construct the arrangement. So, this figure that I have been drawing, okay, this planar graph, how do I even represent the planar graph? Do you know how to represent a planar graph? Have you ever done it anywhere or was it discussed in the any of the lectures? Okay, so, that takes a little bit of effort maybe I should have done that, but right now it is too late. So, let me just say that uh, the this this to represent the planar graph basically you have to show that every face you have to represent every face. So, every face is basically defined by the edges right and the edges are basically defined by the two consecutive vertices right. So, this is the structure that you basically have to store okay. and so now to construct this given that the size of the arrangement itself is n square can you construct the arrangement in order n square time. Now, constructing the arrangement in so I am saying that order n square log n is easy. Can you tell me why? If I had to construct this in order n square log n, it is very easy. It contains all the information, and what is that? All I need to do is take any line, compute the intersection points, and sort them. So, on every line, I have a sorted set of intersection points. Now, if I have that, then I can easily find out any face, right? So, if I have to trace out a face, you know, let us say this one. I just start from here, this is the next intersection point, then I find in the next intersection point I must go backwards, this is the intersection point stored on this line, then again I trace it like this and I finally close it. So, I can easily trace a face or an edge given the sorted intersection points on any line. So, n square log n is very easy because there are n intersection points on each line, each line can be sorted in n log n time, so it is n square log n. But then what you can do is from this bound on the bound on the zone theorem you can do it incrementally. So, when I add the next line because the zone is only size n okay, so zone can be constructed incrementally by adding the lines in any sequence and maintaining the data structure. This is absolutely my last line and this takes time basically order i
So, here you stop here. Because every line I can add in order i time because the zone is order i. So, to be a little careful about that, next line you know little bit more time, little bit more time. So, it is big O of i for uh, adding the ith line. So, the summation is order n square. So, you can beat the n square log n bound using the zone theorem. Okay? And I will try to give you a proof of the zone theorem. I was hoping to do it, but you know it is you know, time is too little. I will do it in the, yeah, that is the question. Every line in, say that again, every line in? Yeah, let us just go. Let me go back. Just a moment. What happened? Huh. So, can you tell me from here? Yeah. So, every, so this L, huh. every line can, oh, no, 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 no. So, uh, every line can, well, Yes and no. So, <laughs> yes and no, yes and no. So, it is effectively yeah, some kind of an averaging argument can be used to show that every line can construct, uh, can contribute only a constant to the zone. So, I will, when I do a proof in the afternoon, basically that is what I am going to do. I will show you basically that every face can be split into two chains and on each side of the chain a line can construct, uh, contribute only once. So, yeah, that is that is a good point, but I am not sure it is strictly true. Uh, uh, but it is something like that. Yeah, I, I won't, I, I won't vouch for it. Yes, 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 yeah. But some lines may show up you know, more often than others. So I, I, I won't say that it is strictly true. I think you can construct a counterexample where a line can show up many more times. Right. All right. Thank you.